I'm Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, and I'd love you to come with me on a school trip through the history, culture, and alchemy of interior design. This time, we are going to be rolling around in the wonderful world of wallpaper. So, when Tyler Brule, style guru and former war correspondent, set out to create a, a glossy new monthly tome of taste for the minimalist 90s, he wanted a title of shockingly counterintuitive tastelessness, something that was going to stir up the sleepy shelves of the lifestyle newsstands. He decided to give his magazine a name that was synonymous with all that was bland and mnia about the interior designscape of the day. So he called his magazine Wallpaper. Now, I do have some sympathy with Tyler's intentions, but I have always looked upon Wallpaper as a little bit of Britain, something with a very big story to tell, a story about society, about democracy and about the distribution of wealth. Wallpaper is a paste the wall, what goes up must come down, expanded vinyl standard that I'm about to raise high above my head and flutter with national pride. Let us now go back to what so irritated Mr. Brulé's taste glands. The average living room of the late 80s, mid 90s could, with little effort, find itself bedecked in a minimum of four different patterns on the walls and at least another two or three at the window. All of which is before you put in the three-piece suite, the cushions, the lampshades and the ornamental Capo de Monte ceramic tramps holding ornamental ceramic balloons. There was no doubt that we were all watching the final painful gasps, the death rattle of a style. Let's rewind though. Let's go back to Wallpaper's late 80s heyday. In the softly lit drawing rooms of Chelsea or the large farmhouse style kitchens of Hampstead, this patentastic orgy of maximalism felt like the epitome of sophistication. Decorating actually looked like the inside of Joan Collins. It was floral, overcomplicated, it had too many seams, way too many bows, and gamely balanced itself on a knife edge between high camp and low posh. This was the extraordinary moment when a fast modernising society deliberately adopted the design drag of an earlier world. Couched in a soft focus vision of somewhere or another in high Victoriana, all of these patterns, and more specifically all of these wallpapers, were all about making comforting panic rooms for a middle class society. A class that felt besieged by angry, striking miners, oil crises, and punk rock with Laura Ashley as High Priestess and Country Diary of an Edwardian Lady as Bible, the suburbs gorged themselves on High Street Sloan style in the faint hope that a wallpaper border and some striped paper under the dado would literally paper over the cracks in their seemingly broken society. And don't forget, this was the era of swags and tales. Why? did we turn to wallpaper in our hour of need? Historically, wallpaper always had one job and one job only to do, which was to make rooms look posh. Really posh people, royals or aristos, they didn't have wallpaper because they had the real thing. Beautifully veined marble inset in cleverly contrasting shades beautifully carved boiseries where 
gilded cherubs fought with fanciful birds for possession of overabundant garlands, literally oozing flowers and fruit. Or painted scenes, views of god-crowded heavens and huge hungry-looking clouds. Now the top of the wall treatment pops was fabric. Fabulously, glamorously, plutonically expensive. Rich figured or cut velvets from Utrecht, cloth of gold from Florence, or best of all, super luxurious pictorial tapestries and embroideries so thickly encrusted with stitched nature, they crunched when you folded them. Hanging your stone cold chamber with fabric was a perfect fusion of comfort and conspicuous consumption, and also had the huge advantage of portability, allowing the, in reality, quite gnarly knights to establish his splendor wherever he went, literally pitching camp in whichever medieval tower he found himself. On to the late Renaissance and lives have become more stable, so we started to want rooms that we could put down roots in. Rather than having our costly fabric draped in easily moved curtains or hangings, we started stretching the material direct over the plastered surface of the wall. And this is exactly the point when the first wallpaper in the Western world starts to crop up. Block printed on card-like paper, it was either trying its hardest to look like a square piece of expensively woven fabric or an inlaid panel of marble. The choice was yours, but the effect was to make your really quite humble home look not that humble at all. Behold, the birth of makeover. In Britain, middle classness gets invented really very early. It took centuries and a load of hugely bloody revolutions to persuade the majority of continental Europe to move on from the feudal pyramid that focused all of its wealth at the tippity top. Once we got over the inconveniences of the pesky old Black Death, the urge to trade, farm, mine, fish and explore all brought coin within the grasp of even the middling sort of Brit. And at a national level, Britain, as an island, never had to waste vast resources on paying for all of those expensively embroidered tabards needed to furnish a border guarding standing army. Unlike, that is, our landlocked continental cousins. Under Elizabeth, James, Charles, Charles and James again, and particularly under Anna Gloria, Brand Britannia ruled the trade waves, creating a, a bonny, hotter than hot high street boom for lovely luxy things. And wallpaper very much became an object of desire. Actually, I suspect that John Bull, even if he could have afforded imported Italian silk for his walls, would have bullishly preferred home printed silk effect on a roll. It is therefore no accident that flock wallpaper was invented by the British for the British, using stenciled glue and leftover wool fluff. How very changing rooms. The aristocratic home in Britain wasn't actually entirely wallpaper free. Accompanying the tea and china in the holds of merchant ships from far away Asia were room high painted panels that could be put together in sequence as continuous wraparound scenes. These minutely detailed and exquisitely painted fantasies of glamorous oriental goings on amidst outrageously colored tropical flora and fauna were, let's face it, the perfect backdrop to the feminized gentility of aristocratic Rococo society. So persuasive was their elegance, British producers like Chippendale started to absorb the motifs they found in the paintings and sprinkle them amongst their own pieces. Mechanized printing meant the British home could truly evolve that particular 
itsy ditsy look we all know and love from period dramas. Even the lowliest could at least stencil or stamp their garrets. And so it progresses from Jane ostentatiousness to full-blown Victorian plumpiness. Ornament, colour, trick the eye tropes, layering, draping and pom-poms. William Morris brought a new thoughtfulness whilst Owen Jones a new intellectualism. Pattern got curly with Art Nouveau, then graphic with Art Deco. In the 30s, wallpaper mongers could flog you something a little bit cubist or a little bit cosy cottage or even a full vista of the Bay of Naples at dusk. The choice was yours. It was your home, your castle, and yes, you could also have printed turrets. After the Second World War, the state-sponsored council of good, polite, well-brought-up design decreed that wallpaper should be jolly, modern, and politely artistic. So they commissioned polite artists like John Piper and Edward Borden to make suitably softly contemporary papers. But come the 60s, and it's the very impolite artists of the pop art and op art movements whose work inspired those, those retina squelching wallpaper effects that have forever sealed the wallpaper fate for baby boomers. Still incited when the goddess of bad taste needs to be worshipped, the unsettling, softly morphing geometry and in dense dirt concealing colour fields is a look that still screams bedsit. So, enough of wallpaper's fascinating psycho baggage. Let's now address how wallpaper can actually help. Turtleneck wearing designer saws of the so called mid century modern school pioneered what we today refer to as the feature wall. Now forget the concept that papering one wall alone is about economy, it's actually very clever decorating. Making one wall more colourful, or in this instance more patterned, makes it a real honey trap for the eye. But the really smart bit is that your bedazzled mind, transfixed by this one beautiful peacock of a wall, forgets about the other three peahen wall surfaces, allowing them to recede into the distance. It's actually about making your room appear bigger. And the secret to getting it right is to make sure your peahens have a mid-tone colour in common with their peacock. And if you're a Jedi designer, then you'll sprinkle the peacock pattern on the odd lampshade or a cushion cover. Another benefit of wallpaper is practicality. Modern paper is much less porous than emulsion. So a papered wool will withstand so much more of life's bumps and grinds and will be helpfully wiped downable should anyone bump or grind your walls. The most powerful gift wallpaper can give to us is shape-shifting. Over the years, our eyes have grown used to reporting distances back to our brains. And we've taught ourselves to look for certain tells. With rooms, we look for corners. We look for straight lines that cast darker shadows. Now, one of wallpaper's greatest attributes is camouflage. A pattern that has a decent tonal difference between background and foreground instantly distracts, literally dazzles the eye, making finding the end of one wall and the beginning of another really hard to discern. Here in my kitchen and here in my dining room, we've used two of my designs to literally dissolve the corners. Horizontal patterns are really good at doing this too. The rules of perspective will mean that the horizontal line on our eye level will remain horizontal, literally a horizon, even when it's forced to bend at each corner. Behold, space magic. Actually, going one better, having a real horizon like these wallpaper murals means that the corners are absolutely impossible to find. As Michael Caine almost said, I told you just to blow the bloody walls off. Back to the 90s and the anti-wallpaper years of the first few wobbly-footed years 
of the 21st century when wallpaper was sneered at and derided as fussy pants and old-fashioned. All it took was a small matter of the next revolution of the fairest wheel of taste. Lo, behold, suddenly everyone's back into the subtle storytelling and reassuring eleganza of the papered wall. We love the way it looks and feels and what it says about us. And now you, my elite, the top students of my school of flock, now you know how and why. As someone of taste and refinement, I suggest you subscribe to School of Flock so you get the latest before anybody else does.